In this bone-chilling documentary, we delve into the disturbing life and crimes of Earl Nelson, a man whose name sends shivers down the spines of those familiar with his gruesome acts. Known as the Gorilla Man, Nelson's reign of terror in the early 20th century left a trail of horror and fear across America. Join us as we unveil the horrifying details of his dark story, attempting to comprehend the mind of a man capable of such unimaginable brutality. In the era before serial killers were pillars in the news, one of North America's most terrible and prolific killers was a man named Earl Nelson. He was born Earl Leonard Farrell in San Francisco, California, on May 12, 1897. His parents, James C. Farrell and Fanny Nelson, died of syphilis before the boy was two years old. Earl found a home with his maternal grandparents, Lars and Mary Jenny Nelson, who were raising their own five children. The family lived at 3525 20th Street in San Francisco. Lars and Jenny were Pentecostals who raised children to believe sex outside of the marriage bed, even the thought of it, meant sure damnation. Earl's childhood was marred by illness and near brushes with death. Earl almost died from diphtheria at age 9. When he was 10, he was hit by a streetcar while riding his bicycle. He sustained an injury to his temple and remained unconscious for six days. Earl recovered physically. Mentally, he was never the same. He suffered from bouts of headaches, memory loss, and a developed morbid disposition. Earl became a withdrawn and sullen child, afraid of anything God might regard as unholy. After all, such things took his parents away. Earl was expelled from school at age seven. He talked to people no one else could see and quoted scripture at the top of his lungs scriptures that mentioned the beast. As a preteen, Earl refused to eat the food prepared for him. Instead, he threw scraps of food on a plate and mixed it with a bottle of olive oil. Earl would slurp this meal from his plate, instead of with silverware provided to him. His aunt would later say that Earl ate five times more than a child his age should. When his grandfather offered him clean clothing, Earl traded it for ragged clothing. Lars died in 1904, and Jenny followed in 1907. Fourteen-year-old Earl went to live with his aunt, Lillian. Earl obsessively changed his clothing. He preferred tattered rags over a new suit. Earl refused to interact with anyone outside of the family. He especially shunned relationships with other children. Instead of talking with Lillian's female visitors, Earl would lift heavy objects with his teeth or walk on his hands. Though Earl wasn't tall, he developed distinctively large hands and feet. The Nelson family possessed traditional Scandinavian features. But Earl's father was a swarthy man of Spanish descent, a trait that Earl inherited. Lillian became afraid of Earl when he started saying dirty things to and about her daughter. He even peeked at the girl when she dressed. Though Lillian loved him, she gave Earl money to sleep elsewhere. Earl adopted the religious beliefs of his grandparents. When he walked, he walked with his face pointed toward the sky, as if he were looking up to heaven. He carried a worn Bible in his arm and read from it during idle times. He wouldn't read anything else. Earl began spending his time in the red light district of San Francisco, where he had his first sexual experiences. Earl also started drinking to excess. He was arrested for robbery on July 28, 1915, and sentenced to two years in San Quentin State Prison in California. In 1917, Earl enlisted in the United States Army but deserted six weeks later. He next used an alias to join the Navy but deserted again. In 1918, a naval psychiatrist had him committed and declared Earl was in a constitutional psychotic state. After two escapes, he was discharged on May 17, 1919. The constant suppression of lascivious thoughts begot new, bigger ones, and Earl did his best to not act on them. Then, on May 19, 1918, Earl pretended to be a plumber and gained entry to the home of Charles Summers. He encountered Charles's 12-year-old daughter, Mary, and tried to assault her sexually. Mary screamed as loud as she could, which alerted her older brother, who came to the rescue. Earl fled, but police caught up and arrested him. The judge sent Earl to Napa State Mental Hospital after finding him insane. 
doctors believed Earl was incurably insane and recommended he remain institutionalized for life. Instead, Earl escaped three times, and the staff quit bothering to return him. Between these escapes, Earl worked at a hospital as a janitor and even married one of the nurses. Earl's new wife was 38 years his senior. During the marriage, Earl refused to bathe and was prone to violent outbursts. Mary left her young husband shortly after the marriage began. Little did anyone know, the worst was yet to come with Earl Nelson. On February 20, 1926, 55-year-old Clara Newman was strangled to death. Clara owned a rooming house at 2037 Pierce Street in San Francisco and had a sign in the window advertising a vacancy. At 1.30 p.m., a man came in and asked Clara to show him the room, which was in the attic. Her nephew, Merton, lived downstairs. He saw the man enter with Clara and provided a description. He was about 30 years old, 5 feet 7 inches, and wore an army shirt with civilian pants. He had a dark complexion though he wasn't black. He wasn't in the attic long before he came down and said to Merton, tell the lady I'll be back in about an hour to rent that room. The man never returned. After an hour, Merton went to check on Clara and discovered her lifeless body, with a cord wrapped tightly around her neck. Merton called the police, who found no trace of the murderer. On May 2, 1926, 65 year old Laura Beale, owner of the Deer Park Apartments in San Jose, California, was found strangled to death. Her husband found her corpse on a bed in a vacant apartment, strangled with the silk belt from her dress. Further examination revealed Laura was also raped. A little over a month later, in San Francisco, 63 year old rooming house owner Lillian St. Mary was murdered in a vacant rental room. Like the others, Lillian had been strangled after a struggle. The police suspected Lillian, Laura, and Clara were killed by the same attacker. They were landladies around the same age. The newspapers began calling the attacker, the Dark Strangler, and the Gorilla Killer, due to his large hands and long arms. Police suspected the perpetrator was a patient at one of the Bay Area asylums and began examining such records. Meanwhile, the killings continued. Ollie Russell of Santa Barbara was strangled June 24. Mary Nisbet was strangled with a towel in Oakland on August 16. Both women were middle-aged landladies, showing a vacancy. The California killings stopped for a while, though similar crimes began in Portland, Oregon. On October 19, 1926, Beata Withers was murdered by strangulation then raped. The murderer stuffed her body in a trunk, found by her 15-year-old son. Virginia Grant, age 59, was killed in the same manner the very next day. The day after that, Mabel Fluke's body was discovered in the attic of her boarding house. The Portland murders stopped almost as quickly as they began, though activity resumed in San Francisco. On November 18, 1926, 56-year-old Anna Edmonds was strangled to death with a rag and raped in her San Francisco home. The next day, the dark stranger attacked a pregnant woman named Mrs. H.C. Murray of Burlingame, California. Mrs. Murray placed an advertisement for a room in her home at 1114 Grove Avenue. At 6 p.m., a man who fit previous descriptions of the strangler arrived to view the vacancy. He attacked her almost as soon as he entered the home, but Mrs. Murray fought back. She scratched his face and hands and screamed so loud the neighbors came. The eight months pregnant woman survived, but the strangler fled. The fact that Mrs. Murray survived spooked the strangler. He left California for the Pacific Northwest. This time the killer struck in Seattle, where he murdered Miss Florence Monks on November 23, 1926. The killer ransacked the home and made off with over $10,000 in jewelry. Six days later, in Portland, Blanche Myers was strangled in her home. Blanche also offered rooms for rent. After death, her killer raped her body and placed her on a bed. This time, police found fingerprints on her wrought iron bedposts. Edna Gaylord operated a rooming house in Portland. Her tenant, Sophie Yates, revealed that before the murder of Blanche Myers, a shabbily dressed man came to the home around 10 a.m. He was short and stocky, with a dark complexion. 
He tipped his tattered hat at Miss Yates and introduced himself as Adrian Harris. Adrian rented a room, sight unseen, and the three hit it off. Adrian even purchased a Thanksgiving dinner when Edna complained she couldn't afford one herself. Although he paid a week's rent, he vacated the room two days early. When he did, he gifted the ladies several pieces of expensive jewelry. Edna went directly to the police, who confirmed that the jewels belonged to Florence Monks. December 23, 1926, the Strangler made an appearance in Iowa when Elmira Burrard was strangled in her Council Bluffs home. Initially, the crime wasn't linked to the Dark Strangler, until an examination proved that she was also raped. A neighbor last saw Elmira with a shabbily dressed man of about 30 years old who called himself Mr. Williams. The killer drifted south to Kansas City, Missouri, where on December 27, he raped and murdered 23-year-old Bonnie Pace. The very next day, Germania Arpin suffered the same fate. Germania's infant son, Robert, was home during the killing. The assailant strangled the eight-month-old baby with a diaper, and Robert became the youngest victim. Both women had a four-rent sign displayed. The strangler ceased his activity for four months while he made his way east. Then, on April 27, 1927, he murdered Mary McConnell in her Philadelphia home. The McConnells had been trying to sell their home for a year. A for sale sign hung in the window. She was 53 years old. The next day, the killer tried to pawn jewelry stolen from Mary. Almost a month later, the murderer traveled to Buffalo, New York. He raped and murdered Jenny Randolph on May 30, 1927. Jenny recently lost her son and worked at the YMCA to take her mind off of her grief. She also let out rooms for extra income. On May 27, a man inquired about a vacancy. Jenny's brother, Gideon Gillette, answered the door that day. The prospective tenant introduced himself as Charles Harrison, a painter from New York, and fit descriptions of the Strangler. After the New York crimes, the Strangler moved on to Detroit. On June 1, 1927, police broke down the door of a second-floor apartment when the owner complained the lights remained on for three days. Once inside, they found the bodies of 29-year-old Maureen Oswald de Torthy and her 59-year-old landlady Fannie Mae. The home was ransacked, and both women strangled. The killer left Detroit and went to Chicago, where he committed his last murder in the United States. On June 2nd, Mary Seatsmo was found dead in her home with a wire around her neck and her skull crushed. There was no trace of the killer. The killer slipped into Canada unnoticed. On June 8th, a man calling himself Mr. Woodcotts checked himself into Mrs. Hill's boarding house at 133 Smith Street in Winnipeg. That day, 14-year-old Lola Cowan went door to door in her Winnipeg neighborhood, selling artificial flowers made by her sister, Marjorie. She never came home. Mr. Woodcotts left suddenly and didn't close the door to his room. Mrs. Hill came in to clean the now vacant room and failed to check under the bed. She rented the room out again within three days. The new tenant discovered the body of little Lola shoved beneath the bed. She had been savagely mutilated and raped. Meanwhile, Emily Patterson was murdered on June 10, 1927, also in Winnipeg. Her killer stuffed her body under her son's bed. He also stole a whipcord suit, gold wedding ring, and $70. Immediately, Canadian police broadcasted a description of Mr. Woodcotts over the radio. They also cautioned women not to allow strangers into their houses under any pretense, especially to rent a room. They offered a $1,500 reward for information leading to the arrest of the person responsible. Police recognized that the man they sought was the Dark Strangler of the United States. Investigators predicted the killer would head back to the States and alerted railroad employees to be on the lookout. The day after the Patterson murder, a local jeweler named Fred England purchased a wedding ring and suit that turned out to be those stolen during the crime. The man who sold the items went to the barber shop next door for a shave and a haircut. Dried blood and scratches covered the man's scalp. When the barber, Nicholas Tabor, asked about them, the man grew irritable and told him not to touch the injuries. 
several reports of strangler sightings came from across Canada. On June 16, 1927, police in Killarney, Manitoba, arrested a man who matched the strangler's description. The man called himself Virgil Wilson, was calm and collected, he was not the raging, murderous devil the constables expected. Nevertheless, constables kept him in jail, intending to rule him in or out. Virgil found a file in his jail cell and used it to escape that evening. He attempted to flee to the States by hopping on a train. The train he chose happened to be transporting members of the Winnipeg police. Within 12 hours, Virgil found himself jailed at the Rupert Street Police Station. Constables booked him in, took his picture, and fingerprints. The photograph was distributed to police stations throughout Canada and the United States. Several witnesses confirmed that this Virgil Wilson was the same man they encountered during the U.S. murders. San Francisco police matched Virgil's fingerprints to those of Earl Nelson. They also matched fingerprints and teeth marks to those found at crime scenes. Earl Nelson was the dark strangler. At first, Earl admitted the crimes. Later, he recanted his confession and insisted he was innocent. Earl Nelson's murder trial was scheduled to begin on June 27, 1927. His attorney, James Stitt, requested a postponement, which was granted. The trial began November 1, 1927, in Winnipeg and was heard by Justice Andrew Dysart. The prosecutor was R. B. Graham. Earl's ex-wife testified that Earl was insane and couldn't be responsible for his actions. Many other witnesses placed him near the scene of his Canadian crimes. It was indisputable that he possessed Emily Patterson's jewelry and that he rented the room where Lola Cowan's body was found. Attorney Stitt didn't attempt to argue Earl's innocence. Instead, he asked the court for clemency because Earl was insane. The jury took no pity on Earl, sane or not. Earl Nelson was handed a swift death sentence on November 5, 1927. Early on the morning of January 13, 1928, Earl Leonard Nelson was hanged for the murders of Emily Patterson and Lola Cowan at the Fawn Street Jail in Winnipeg. Earl's last words were, I am innocent. I stand innocent before God and man. I forgive those who have wronged me and ask forgiveness of those I have injured. God have mercy. Earl Nelson was only convicted of two murders in Canada. An American trial would have only prolonged his sentence in Canada. Still, irrefutable evidence proves he was responsible for the killing of at least 20 women. As we conclude our journey into the twisted mind of Earl Nelson, the Corella Man, we are reminded of the importance of understanding the depths of human depravity to prevent such atrocities from happening again. Nelson's legacy of terror and pain serves as a stark reminder that even amidst the darkest corners of society, we must strive for justice and vigilance. May the victims of Earl Nelson rest in peace, and may we learn from history to ensure a safer and more compassionate world for all. Thank you for joining us on this harrowing exploration of true crime.